and Mike and Trish. I've got a piece in to the phone. If you would let me know how that sound is. Sound is not good as we hoped. Okay, good. Let me take this out. <clears throat> All right, how about now? Echo though. Oh no, put it back in. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just slide this up and get closer. Y'all go ahead and hit that share button if you will. Please put your prayer request. Let me go ahead and write some of this in. Roger Winslet. I'll just slide this up and get closer. Y'all go ahead and hit that share button if you will. Remember Connie, of course. Please put your prayer request. Let me go ahead and write some of this in. Roger Winslet. Let's see. Y'all go ahead and hit that share button if you will. Hit that off right there. Connie Winslow's mother. Uh, let's see, Shane Dockery's grandmother. Y'all be sure to write these down for yourself and uh, pray for these individually. His his grandmother, 93 years old, uh, broke her leg. She uh, got a um, had surgery. Surgery went good. She's in re she'll be in rehab. So that's a good update for that. Um, let's see. Who else? Who else? Who else? Chet Taylor. <clears throat> oh, quit that. I'll pin those. All right, we will. Um, hey, Beth. Hey, everybody. Don't forget, reach over there and hit the share button. All right, let's talk about tonight the ministry of Jesus. Before we get started, we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, and then we'll get into this. So make sure that your Bibles are open. Mark chapter six. That's where we're going to be. Uh, but let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful to be yours and be able to speak to you whenever we so desire, have need. Uh, Father, we pray that we will speak to you not in times of just need, but also in benefit of blessing, seasons where we give you praise for what you've done. Father, we love you, and we love your Son and your Spirit, and we pray that we can ascertain from this book what you would have us to as we look into the ministry of your Son. Uh, Father, help us to mimic this ministry. Help us to implore the things we learned tonight in the ways that you would have us to. Father, we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. I'm standing in the building tonight for the sake of illustration. Often when we think about a minister and we think about ministry, we think about something such as this. We think of uh, a building. We think of the worship service. We think of the preacher who stands up front. I know for years and years I always heard and saw that the fellow who preached served in the capacity of minister. And 
you know, we often talk about how denominational world will, the denominational world will abuse certain terms. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. Um, such it is as a pastor that is, that is used across the, the theological board uh, isn't always a biblical pastor. And when we use the term minister, I hope that we understand we're not talking about just one man who serves in the capacity of preaching. Uh, his role and designation through Scripture is a preacher of the Word. A minister literally means a servant. Anybody can take the form, and everybody should be taking the form of a minister. And if you were to define ministry, you might think of some kind of act or service. Marion Webster defines it as this. It's a personal service, a religious office, position in a church, service or duty, activity of a servant, a duty, a task, or support. And although we don't go to, to Miriam for our biblical definition, I think it paints a good picture of what we're looking at this evening. It's not just what you see in a building. It's not just what uh, somebody does for the auditorium. Um, it's often common that people will sit down and think, okay, I'm here to be ministered to. And in some ways they are. The word is to be ministered to them. The shepherds have oversight to feed the flock of God. And they exercise that often through the preacher who preaches and feeds the word uh, by the authority of the elders. They relinquish that for him, they oversee his work, and they delegate that to the flock. But if we just look at the term minister, we're talking about somebody who ministers and they serve and they, they do for. They act on behalf of. They provide a service you know as well as I do, that can come in a host of different ways. And so tonight what we're going to do is look at the life and ministry of Jesus and take a, take a picture, if you will, of, of what my ministry is supposed to be about. It's not just the preacher, and as you're going to see, it's a whole lot more. Uh, a fellow by the name of Paul David Tripp, he had a quote about ministry. And he said, personal ministry is not about always knowing what to say. It's not about fixing either in sight that is broken. Personal ministry is about connecting people with Christ so that they are able to think as he would have them think, desire as he would have them or desire what he says is best, and do what he calls them to do, even if their circumstances never get fixed. I like that, that statement. It says it involved exposing hurt, lost, and confused people to God's glory so that they may, that they give up their pursuit of their own glory and live for his. Simply put, ministry is something that we are. We are ministers of the gospel. We are ministers toward one another. We're ministers of God. We, we serve him. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, Peter says, and he's writing to Christians who've been scattered out, persecuted, uh, for their faith, and he says that Jesus, when we're looking at Jesus, that he's leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Um, we, we, we know Paul said on one occasion, imitate me as I imitate the Lord Jesus. And the word uh, imitate in that passage, we get our, our word um, mimic. The word is mimitase, and we are to you think about somebody who mimes, a mime is somebody who reflects something, or when you, when you mimic something else, you're copying what somebody else is doing. Don't ever do that to Missy. It drives her crazy. <laughs> but when you mimic, that means that you're taking what they are and you're mimicking that. When we're looking at the idea of mimicking Jesus, Paul said, mimic me, but you're not mimicking me. You're mimicking Jesus. So we often call people to do the same thing in the same way that we're calling people to Jesus to live out the life that we ourselves are living. When we look at Jesus' ministry, Luke chapter 3 and verse 23, it's roughly he's about the age of 30. But that's what we see. There's a couple of passages that, that kind of give us that indicator of his ministry as in his coming out party to the world as the Savior was one who it began when he was 30 years old. But when we take the idea of ministry, you know as well as I do, Jesus ministered uh, previously, but his ministry out into the word as God's son did not begin until his baptism as John records it. As some of you may know, um, Missy stays at home now and she's able to do that and we're thankful and we're blessed and 
and and coming here to Piedmont Road, that was a huge um, a huge benefit for us coming here. Is that Mama don't have to work anymore if she don't want to, and so Missy had to leave working school and getting her master's, and she finished her master's, but leaving the school system and leaving her children, her special education children, uh, she has a want to want to continue to serve those children. But what she sees is, is that I'm able to minister at home for you women who stay at home, or if it's the case, the man who has to stay at home, or whatever the case is. When you stay at home, you're doing God's work. If you're keeping up with our show, The Home of God, Derek and I talked about uh, last Thursday about this picture of the gospel and our children responding uh, to sin as they should. When we minister to our families, when we serve our families, biblically speaking, that's an everyday thing. You, as a New Testament Christian, are a, uh, what Peter would call you as, you serve as a, as a priest. We're a kingdom of priests, and we, we are able to worship God through Jesus, and we don't need a, a physical priest. All New Testament Christians are priests, and that we can offer acceptable worship to God. But a part of that priesthood, if you will, is that we serve in various different capacities. When I serve I, as a minister of the gospel, uh, I do that on Sundays and on Wednesdays and now almost every day through this, um, sorry Beth, the sound's breaking up now and then, <clears throat> but I serve as the, as the pulpit minister here, meaning that my vocation is that I serve through the pulpit or by and with the pulpit. Uh, but for somebody who isn't, quote, a preacher or a deacon or an elder, you're just what we call a regular church member, okay? Uh, don't let that devalue your position in the kingdom. Everybody is a minister of God, whether you're doing it at work, whether you're doing it at home, or whether you're doing that within your own soul or to the souls of other people. We are all biblically ministers. When you think about Jesus and what he did, and let's go ahead and jump on over to uh, Mark chapter 6. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6, verse 34. This is where this uh, picture begins of Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> He's just fed the 5,000, but verse 34 it says, And when he, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many different things. Sheep without a shepherd. Wherever, if you look down at verse 50, you think it's verse 56, it says, And when he, Jesus, uh, whenever, and whenever he came in villages, cities, and, or countryside, they laid their sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might, that he might, they, meaning Jesus and his disciples, might touch them. Uh, I'm sorry. They implored him that they, the sick, might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as had touched it were made well. So, a wonderful picture, but you notice at the first of that, it says whenever he came into the place, people wanted him to serve, and he did. And this idea of compassion, biblically, compassion isn't just something that you, an emotion that you have, but biblical compassion is that this is a, this is a feeling that you have inside that compels you to worship, or compels you to serve, or to minister, or, or it, meaning that it bothers you if you don't. Your conscience bothers you. Jesus' conscience bothered him. He had compassion on them because these people were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus himself being that good shepherd. Uh, John 10 verse, 70, verse 7 says that Jesus is the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. Uh, so we're looking at a, a wonderful picture of who he is. 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, the, I think it's verse 11, Jesus is called the, the great or the good shepherd, the, the head shepherd, of, if you will. But this ministry of Jesus, he had a mission that wherever he went, he ministered to people. I need to make that my mission. We, we can get carried away in the church if we're not careful that we, we take our eyes off of the mission, which is the mission of Jesus to seek and to save the lost, to teach, to baptize, to teach, and to, to, to win souls for the glory of God. If we're not careful, we can make our the church about maybe our programs or what we have to offer or what ways we're, we're trying to physically help people. Not demeaning that we should physically help people. We should. Jesus physically helped people, but he didn't just help them physically. 
He helped them physically to, to bring them to a, a right spiritual state. He, he showed that he was going to be benevolent. He was going to minister benevolence to people so that he might minister spiritual benevolence. So when you see somebody walking by, don't be just concerned about their maybe their empty stomach or maybe the shoes on their feet. Be concerned about it, yes, but for the sake of saving their soul. There was also a message in this ministry. The mission was to seek and to save, but the message, if you look in chapter 6, look at verse 2. In verse 1 it says, and he, went, and he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath day he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Verse 34, even what we read just a second ago, when he went ashore, he saw them, he had multiple, he had uh, compassion on them and at the end of that verse it says and he began to teach them many things Jesus did not leave people spiritually where they were there was a truth and Jesus spoke it there was a message and Jesus had it and shared it with other people he declared this message his kingdom his kingship his messiahship and we should be about that whatever way that we are serving in the kingdom of God all of us are ministers am I a good minister or am I not or rather, am I a faithful minister? The verse we looked at last week, last Sunday night, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, what does God require of his stewards of the gospel? Just that they be faithful. Be faithful. In John chapter 12, if you want to flip over there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, notice what Jesus said about this message. In verse 48, we'll begin. Well, we'll start in verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. For those religious folks out there that say there's other ways to God other than Jesus, it's not true. Verse 45, Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come into the world, but I did not come, come to judge the world, but to save the world. What well, does that mean? Jesus isn't concerned about how we respond? Yes. But what he's saying is, is my focus necessarily right now is not to cast final judgment, but to preach the gospel. Much it is the case with you and I. We're not in the business of casting final judgment on people as though we are the judge. We bring the message and the way they respond, the Lord casts his judgment. And it's not final until they die in that lost state. Verse 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me, he has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. What should we preach? What, should we, what kind of words should carry our ministry? Well, simply the words of Jesus. Often it's the case when we begin to study with people, sometimes we get in trouble, um, not because of what God says, but because of how we say what we're saying or because we involve ourselves too much in it. Maybe we interject our opinion. I hope it, we understand as New Testament Christians, when we're studying with people, I, I want to make sure that this person in front of me knows this is not what Jake says, this is what God says. And if we simply just point people to the scriptures and we stop, quote, telling people, we let them to discover it for themselves and say, well, what do you think about this verse? What are your thoughts on this verse? What is Jesus saying in this verse? When they discover, learn for themselves, I promise you that will go a whole lot better than you barking at them. I never find a case in an occasion where Jesus looks at somebody who is outside of him, who is, quote, not religious, and he barks at them, or he has a demeanor of meanness. The Lord's servant is not quarrelsome, Paul told Timothy. It's not quarrelsome. You may know some brethren that fight with one another, or they, their approach is violent or harsh, or they bicker, or they malign, or they, they attack the soul of a person, not with the gospel, but with maybe ugly words. That's not godly in any way. There's a ministry, and there's a message. But notice the miracles. Go back to Mark chapter 6. 
In verse 38, we'll, we'll pick up here. Incidentally, uh, Dave Miller has a very good book that he's just released, and he sent it here to Piedmont Road, I think, last week or two weeks ago. And if you want to go and maybe research Apologetics Press, I think it's .org, um, Dave Miller's new book on miracles. Very good, short read, very simple, very easy. You, you would enjoy the good study. You would, you would uh, do well to, um, to have a hold of that. But in verse 38, this, this, this miracle of Jesus uh, I don't want to read all the way through 44 and where he heals the sick, where he walks on the water in verse 45. But it says that, that Jesus performed these miracles. He fed the 5,000 out of the two and the five loaves and the fish. And, and, he, and he, he walks on the water and, and he heals the sick. For the sake of time, we're not going to read it. I trust you will. But there was a miracle inclined. A, a dear friend, my instructor when I was in school with B.J. Clark at the School of Preaching, uh, he has a quote. He said, at every step of his life, Jesus Christ confront, or confronts us with the supernatural. He was born by supernatural birth. He was protected by supernatural ministration of angels. He possessed supernatural knowledge. He could do supernatural things. Indeed, the boundaries of Christ's miracles are themselves miracles. The virgin birth of Jesus. His resurrection and ascension, simply put, his entrance into the world was miraculous. His departure from the world was miraculous, and his life in the world was miraculous. Uh, I could be off, but it's roughly approximately 35 miracles that Jesus had performed uh, that's recorded for us. John, I think, only records six or seven of those miracles, but at the end of the book of John, John writes something in John chapter 20. He says, now Jesus did many other signs and wonders in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Not everything that Jesus did was recorded. Uh, the books couldn't contain it, if you will. But these miracles, Jesus went out and, and preached and taught, and these miracles accompanied his preaching and teaching. In Mark chapter 16, in verse 20, it says that they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. What was the purpose of miracles after all? It wasn't for the sake of healing somebody physically. Jesus did that. He was benevolent to people. He ministered to people. But the miracle was designed to bring them to him. I can deny the very act of nature itself. Follow me. And some did and some did not. But the miracles were designed to confirm the word that was preaching. If somebody came to you today for a hypothetical situation... And they come to you and they say that this is the truth of God and they are able to work a miracle, something that denies the act of nature. Well, we would say, well, that has to be the truth. Such it was the case in the first century. The days of miracles have ceased, roughly, I think 1 Corinthians 13 deals with that idea that we have the perfect revelation of God. And so we have no need for a modern man-willed miracle, if you will, as we see in the pages of the Bible. But the message was designed to go out to minister to people, and the miracles uh, confirmed the word that was preaching. Well, that has to be true. They defy the very acts of nature. That was the designation of, of miracles. But we need to be in the business of, although we can't perform miracles for people, we can serve people. God still calls us to serve people through his scripture. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, so as we have opportunity, meaning as the, the occasion arises, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, that, that my wallet is not designed just for me, but my wallet is designed by God so that I can give to the world, and especially those of the household of faith. But it's, it's designated to, to go out, Jake, I'm giving you this money, I'm giving you this blessing, this opportunity to go out and serve and minister to people, not just preach on Sunday. If Jake is only uh, a minister in that he preaches on Sunday, Jake's off. Jake is wayward. Jake's not faithful to the call of Christ. If I look at a brother or sister who has a need and say, well, I'm just the preacher, I can't help you. <laughs> uh, we all need to be in the business of, of, of scrubbing toilets and washing feet. We all need to be in the business that nobody is above serving one another. Jesus himself got on his hands and his knees and he washed the disciples' feet. And he said, this is needful for me to do this, teaching these young men a lesson about service and servitude. The methodology of the ministry of Jesus 
going back to chapter 6, whether it be 31, verse 34, verse 55, this is what we see about Jesus in his ministry. If you're writing these down, number one, he spent time with people. He spent time with people. You can't properly minister to people unless you involve yourself with their life. If you just wait by the phone for somebody to call you and ask you for something, you're going to wait a long time. Most people are not going to ask that. If somebody's sick or in the hospital or they can't cut their grass or they can't go get their groceries, go and do it for them. Maybe call or text and say, hey, I'm at the grocery store. Will you text me your list? Or what can I pick up for you? Uh, I'm here. There's a two-for-one sale. And, and, and let me bring this by your house. Whatever the case may be, we need to be in the business of just going ahead and doing it. And, 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 if, and if it's the case that somebody's more private or more personal and they don't like that, then maybe we need to have that conversation beforehand. But, but if we're just waiting on opportunities to arise, we're not really looking as ministers of Jesus. We've got to spend time with people. Number two, Jesus saw the needs of people and responded accordingly. I need to deal with people as they are in the situation that they're in. If it's the case that they're spiritually outside of Christ, I need to remember that. And, and, and if, it's, if it's the case that you're ministering to people and you're trying to be Jesus to people, you need to remember that those people aren't Christians, that those people aren't church. And I can't expect that person to pigeon toe to New Testament standards because they don't know New Testament standards. And I need to understand that. I need to be sympathetic. They are outside of Christ. They're outside of the knowledge of Christ. And I need to reach people where they are. I've got to be with them, but I've got to respond accordingly. Number three, he had compassion for those to whom he ministered to. There's nothing worse than somebody who complains about ministering to other people. Um, fellas, it will do you no good to complain about a work, then do the work and expect to receive uh, blessing from others or blessing from God in that process. Ladies, if you're cooking a meal for somebody who's shut in and you're complaining or you have angst in your heart because you're having to do this or you, you, you can't wait to tell other people about what you've done, that's not biblical. Jesus never did such a thing. Number four, Jesus had the heart of a servant. Not the blood pump, but the mental seat of emotion, biblically speaking. This is who he was. You can, you can often hear the tone in people's voice when you may ask them of something, and you have a need, and you ask them to help you with the need, and either you hear a huff or their tone changes. That person in that season does not have the heart of a servant a heart of a minister. Jesus was ready and able and capable to do as best as he could for people. I need to be in the same boat. Number five, Jesus was organized in the way that he went about things. There is a proper way to help people. There's a, sometimes it's the case that, that if a person maybe is, is dealing with an addiction, then maybe giving the money isn't the best solution. Maybe it's the case that you invite them to your home or you invite them to the church building and you feed them. And you say, well, I can't give you money, or I don't think it'd be best or wise to give you money, but I'm going to feed you, or I'm going to clothe you, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to serve you in the way that I can. That's most beneficial. And sometimes if it's the case that we're unorganized, we can uh, try to help people, but it, it may not be as efficient, or it may not do as much good. Number next, number six, Jesus delegated authority meaning he got others involved in the work. Jesus didn't let things just pile up on him. If you're the personality that you are, quote, the minister, or you're the giver, or you're the one who does most, maybe it's in your house, or maybe it's in your neighborhood, maybe it's for your school, your children's PTA, or whatever the case that they're in, if you're the type of person that you, you constantly minister to people, um, you're robbing people of an opportunity to serve. One of the reasons and one of the great things I love about Piedmont Road is the elders and the deacons and, and the preachers, we get to stay in our lane. And, and the elders see fit that if a deacon has a work, then the deacon works the work. That if the preacher has a work, he works the work. And they, they, uh, they shepherd the flock of God and they delegate the work. That's the true biblical picture. And everybody's allowed to stay in their lane. And I promise you, efficiency of the church will be a whole lot higher and stress will be a whole lot lower if everybody stays in their own lane. Uh, Jesus delegated authority. He didn't hold everything unto himself. And then number seven, his ministry went wherever he went. His life was his ministry. And whether you know it or not, your life is your ministry. Biblically speaking, 
You are a servant. You are a minister. You are one who serves literally tables if you need be in the kingdom of God. If I want to be successful in my ministry, if you want to be successful in yours, meaning your day-to-day, Jake, if you can preach a humdinger of a, of, a, of a sermon, and you can knock it out of the park, but if you don't serve your family, that's no benefit. That's really not a heart of a servant. That's really not a true servant. If I want to be faithful like Jesus in my ministry, I've got to incorporate and mimic the things that he did. Let's talk about this aspect of ministry, if you will. And this is point number five. Let's talk about the misery of ministry. In chapter 6, verse 3 through 6, we looked at this last week about Jesus' family. And they couldn't, the Pharisees couldn't understand. He's teaching and they're astonished and where did this man get this education? But he wasn't welcome in his hometown. Um, sometimes if you serve people and that's something that you seek out to do, don't be, don't be surprised when they don't serve you in like fashion. Now, keep in mind, that is not why you serve other people. You serve because you've been served salvation, that God has served you with Jesus and the Holy Spirit's revelation, this word, and, and you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You're, you're not without want. You, you don't have a lack, and thus you serve. But don't be surprised when the world does not respond to your service in the way that maybe you responded to God's or maybe you respond to other people's service. Maybe when somebody does something great for you, you respond um, joyously. Maybe you send them a card. Maybe you call them on the phone. Maybe you give them a big bear hug. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Maybe you never let some people live down for the great they have done for you. But don't be surprised when people don't reciprocate that emotion, when they don't thank you back. That can, that can weigh on you if you're not careful. But I want you to keep in mind why you do what you do, why you serve and why you minister. And you're not looking for the attaboys and the way to goes. You're looking for the, the approval, the recognition of Jesus and of God and his spirit in the way that you work and exercise your life. That you're not here for the pats on the back. You're here to be a faithful servant, and that is all. This can be hard. <clears throat> if you recall when Aaron went into the, the tent of meeting, as it was called in the Old Testament, that when he went in, he, he had on his, his, um, his shoulders the, the six names of the tribes over here and the other six names of the tribes over here. And, and literally, he, he wore those names into the, the tabernacle, that tent, and that one time a year that he went in to see the Holy of Holies, he wore those people into, his, into the Holy of Holies. Maybe as shepherds of the kingdom or maybe as deacons or preachers or, or, or missionaries, you, you shoulder people, you, you uphold people. You, I know here, the elders here, um, they wear the names of the church on their shoulders, as it were, and, and that can become burdensome. And the wonderful thing is God has designed in his church that there is to be a plurality of elders, not just one pastor, but, but several pastors who, who serve and feed in the flock of God, and that they, they, they bear this burden together. The brotherhood, not just the elders, but the brotherhood in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, we're called to help each other bear one another and bear one another's burdens and to uphold one another. You've seen it the case that maybe you're moving and you, you, you want to get something moved that's maybe not, that, maybe not that heavy, and this doesn't require a whole lot of work. And you pick it up and you take it and you put it in the U-Haul and you go back in the house to get something, and, but all of a sudden this is heavy <laughs> and you've got to have help. Well, that's this picture of Galatians 6 and verse 1, that we, we bear one another's burdens. 1, verse 2, and even down to verse 10, this is a picture that we, we do as best as we can for folks that we serve. But there is a, there's a stark warning in James chapter 3. I want to read to you about maybe you want to serve in the capacity of a teacher. Uh, maybe you want to preach. Maybe you have a desire to preach or to serve in, in maybe a Bible class teacher. Or maybe you want to... Um, you know, be a preacher, be an elder one day, or you want to serve, or, or whatever it is. But in James chapter 3, if I get there, in verse 1, the Holy Spirit through James gives a warning. He says, Now many of you should, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Sometimes we look at that verse and say, okay, God's going to hold us to a different standard, but I don't think that's the case. And 
One of my instructors in school, Garland Elkins, a very wise man, he said, I don't think so much that that's about God judging us to a stricter standard. I think that's my brethren judging me to a stricter standard. And I, and I find that to be the case. If you step out in faith and you step out into the word and you want to minister to people and you want to teach people the gospel, you're wearing a very big target on your back. They often joke about preachers and they live in glass houses is that people are looking and watching and waiting for you to fall. Now, 99% of the brotherhood is not that way. 99% of the brotherhood are wonderful, glorious, God-fearing people who are nothing but an encouragement, but there is a small percentage that they're looking and they're judging based off of, well, they're not as good as they think they are. And if you're listening to that, um, God rebukes you through his scripture. Don't, don't hold people to a higher standard that God doesn't. Uh, we, we are in this together. And for those of us who serve, for those of you who serve in capacities, yes, you were a target, uh, but it's the case that, that you may be judged stricter by the world and that the world looks at you harder and, and holds you up to the glass and say, all right, well, I'm not going to toe the line, but you better toe the line. Well, just, just be ready for that. There's some, there's some of that misery in the ministry that came with Jesus and his disciples, and it will certainly come to us today. In John 15 and verse 20, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, then they will persecute you. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly shall suffer persecution. Luke 14 and verse 28, Jesus tells this parable about a man going to war and building a house, and, he, and this idea is that not having enough, if you will. And he says, no wonder then we are to count the cost. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's a wonderful picture that Peter's painting for us. If I step out in faith and I live out my Christianity, and this morning as you heard, I pray that we're living in the process, that we're, we're going day to day, that's going to be met with misery with physical misery, not spiritual misery, I promise. But if we're met with physical misery for the sake of the gospel, Jesus, rather God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, this idea, this picture is that it rests upon you. What a comforting statement. I know God is with me. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, Jesus says uh, in regards to withdrawing from a wayward brother or sister who will not repent after the first, second, and third admonition, he said, that I am with you, that when two or three are gathered together, I am with you. He's not talking about the context of worship. He's talking about members of the body of Christ, maybe it be the preacher, elder, or brother and sister, that they're having to exercise spiritual discipline to another wayward brother or sister, even though they won't respond, they won't repent. Jesus says, I'm with you. Because it can be very hard to pull away from people that you love because they won't obey the gospel. They won't continue in that obedience. They won't go back to Christ, if you will. Jesus said in John chapter 19 and verse 30, while he was hanging on the cross, it is finished. His earthly work, his earthly ministry was now complete, and he had fulfilled that then. But you see, his ministry and the Holy Spirit's ministry through this word is ongoing, and it's constantly ongoing. And may you and I be the ministers that we need to be with this word that empowers us to live in such a way. If you have any comments or any, any other prayer requests, we'll pray before we dismiss. And we'll pray for the list that I penned. Um, if anybody else has any comments or prayer requests. check this out make sure it's not lagging no we're good it's just on my end
Okay, I don't have any other, any other folks in here. Um, let's go ahead and take these, these names forward to the Lord, if you don't mind. Father, we pray that we can be the right ministers you'd have us to be, that we can look into your word and see the ministry of Jesus and see his message and see his methods. And Father, help us to be of like mind. Help us to serve. Father, help us to give all that we can give. But Father, also it's the case that just as Jesus did, sometimes there are seasons of rest. Sometimes, as it is in Mark 6, that we need to pull away because we can't, the ministry is too much. Sometimes it's the case that we need to stop ministering and be ministered to. Father, help us to know when that time is. Help us to stay physically and spiritually healthy so that we can have a good reading of where we are in our spiritual walk. Father, we pray for our brother Roger as he continues to get better. We are so thankful for your grace, and we're thankful that he has, he has given your life to, to shepherding your people. We, we just pray that that would continue. Father, we're thankful that his health has returned and it, he is on a much better path and rehab is to start soon. And Father, that we can get him back as, as quick as we can. But Father, we're just thankful that he's still here. But Father, whether we would have lost Brother Roger or whether we, or we would have maintained him, you are still good and wise and we give you the glory. Father, we pray that you'll be with Claudia Moss that you'll be with Connie's mother as she departs from this life. Father, this is a, a long process, and, and this is something that is taken, um, that's dragging out. And Father, we, we, we say that because it, it wanes on us physically to, to know a person is leaving this life. But Father, we know that she was faithful in you, and based upon the words that we have in front of us, we know that her soul will be at rest and at peace eternally with you. <clears throat> Father, we long to be there together. Father, we, we pray for Chet Taylor, and we pray that we can uh, be a benefit to him. Father, we're thankful for the good news of Barbara Mabry. Lord, we pray for um, Shane Dockery's grandmother as she has re recovered well from her surgery and as her rehab starts. Father, we just pray that you'll uh, bless everyone physically, if it be your will. But Father, more importantly, we ask for the spiritual health for these individuals. We just pray that, that the gospel has penetrated everyone that we've mentioned and their, that their soul is right with you. Father, that is more important than any day in this life that we may live. Father, help us to serve. Help us to serve with the right heart, with the right mind. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.